Hey, this is Dr. A bringing you some clinical chemistry review with um, enzymes and introduction. So, um, um, introduction to enzymes, they are a biological catalyst, so they are neither consumed nor permanently altered uh, as part of the chemical reaction. So, I like to think of them as assembly lines. So, if you anything that goes through an assembly line gets parts and things that added to it, but the assembly line itself does not become part of the product, of the end product. So in that manner, enzymes are very much like assembly lines. Um, enzyme concentration measurement can help detect cellular injury and identify abnormalities that cause disease. I will post some videos about specific enzymes that we measure that detect cellular injury. And of course, you also um, must know that enzymes are part of the um, reactions that measure a lot of uh, non-enzymatic components like glucose, for example. So um, enzymes are proteins. So um, they have a three-dimensional um, structure and even a 440 or quaternary structure. So their primary structure is a sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure is how those amino acids start folding either in random coils or spirals or um, beta uh, pleated sheets and stuff. So um, those, as those amino acids are assembled, they start taking on a secondary structure. And as the secondary structure folds and come into to play, then that tertiary structure, which is a three-dimensional structure of the enzyme, comes into play. Um, it is. Uh, it, ha it can have a quaternary structure if, for example, it needs another protein or something else added to it. Um, but every protein at least has a tertiary or 3D structure. And um, that shape, um, that 3D shape does dictate how the enzyme functions. And if that shape is altered in any way, then the enzyme could be um, like inactive, basically. Um, and so uh, each enzyme catalyzes a specific reaction and is often named after that reaction. And it is facilitated by its three-dimensional shape. That what, that's what the shape is what allows um, the, the uh, reactants to bind to form the product, uh, bind to the enzyme and then form the product. Um, so a lot of the enzymes end um, in ACE, not all of them, okay? But um, you can pretty much bet if you see a word that ends in ACE, you are talking about an enzyme. And they often include the name of the substrate or group that it's working on. Enzymes are very efficient, which means it only takes a little bit to do a lot because it can repeat the same reaction over and over and over again. So, you know, a little bit of enzyme can uh, produce a lot of product. The substrate is what it uses to create the product and product is what is produced. And depending on the enzyme and the direction of the reaction, uh, in in um, the amount of substrate or product, the reaction could go one way or the other. And a substrate, you could have multiple substrates. So you could have two things that, uh, two substrates that are um, being joined together to create one product, or you could have one substrate that's being pulled apart to create two products. So uh, it just kind of depends on what's going on in the direction of the rate of the reaction. The uh, active site is the site where the substrates will bind uh, by non-covalent bonding, which meaning it is not a permanent bond. It is kind of like a, a post-it bond, right? It sticks, but um, it's it, it sticks long enough for the reaction, but then it can let go really easily. When uh, it binds, it forms the enzyme substrate complex. And um, the allosteric site is a site where regular molecules can bind and it's away from the active site. A lot of times when an enzyme binds on the allosteric, uh, um, sorry, a molecule binds on the allosteric site of the enzyme, it can change the shape of the enzyme, which then uh, changes the shape of the active site and makes it inactive. Uh, enzymes are located um, usually intracellularly, but you can find them in the cytoplasm and within the cell membrane itself and within the mitochondria. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about reaction rates of chemical reactions. So uh, enzyme kinetics refer to uh, looking at the rate of chemical reactions and that rate of chemical reaction can change over the course of the reaction. 
Um, and so sometimes it's like slower at the beginning, but once it gets going, the rate goes um, up in speed significantly. Um, the product formation is affected both by uh, the enzyme concentration and is um, only proportional to the enzyme concentration as long as there's substrate excess. Obviously, to have product, you also have to have substrate. So if you run out of substrate, you're going to run out of product. Okay. And um, some of the reaction rate factors, so things that can um, affect how, how quickly an enzyme works or how efficient it is, is the pH, the temperature, uh, the presence of cofactors like uh, molecules like magnesium or zinc and stuff, and then the presence of inhibitors that would obviously prevent the reaction from happening. Um, so pH uh, in the body can, can vary uh, depending, like if you think of um, the pH in um, stomach, it's really low, but in the blood, it's more neutral, actually it's slightly alkaline. Uh, and then temperature, obviously body reaction, um, or body reactions would occur at 37 Celsius, um, and that is the temperature at which a lot of the measurements are done in uh, analysis and chemistry. And um, if your uh, analyzer's temperature is off, it could affect um, your results and a lot of times your quality control and stuff like that. In body chemistry, with the cofactors, if you're missing some of the cofactors, so maybe you don't have enough zinc on board or enough magnesium and stuff like that, some of these enzymatic reactions aren't going to happen as well, and you're going to be missing um, you know, some of the products that you need. So um, when we assess enzyme activity, we usually do it in the linear phase, and I'm going to show you that here in just a second. All right, as you can see in these graphs uh, that represent the um, absorbance over time of the enzymatic reaction, when it first gets going as a lag phase, um, the speed is just kind of slowly building. And then once you get into this linear phase right here, um, it, the speed is constantly going up in a completely linear fashion. And then as you run out of substrate, it's going to hook and slow back down there. Okay, and so um, this graph here is going to show um, the reaction rate curves with different amounts of enzymes. So uh, the first one right here has a low amount of enzymes, so it's slow getting going, and then you can see the speed of absorbance over time here is um, a lot slower, a lot less absorbance for each time increment, right? And uh, if you have medium enzyme activity, it gets going a little faster, and then it speeds up, 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 up in this linear phase. And then uh, you can see, obviously, absorbance reaches higher in a short amount of time. And then uh, this one has the highest one, so the lag phase is really short, and then it goes up in the, the angle here is really, really high, and it climbs really, really high, and it reaches substrate depletion a lot faster. All right, so um, those are three um, graphs that basically represent the um, different speeds of enzymatic activity, but um, measured obviously here in the linear phase. So the thermodynamics of enzymatic reactions is you have a transition state. It's the energy barrier that has to be overcome for the reaction to take place. And um, the activation energy is the energy needed to overcome that transition state and enzymes help lower that activation energy so it, they make it easier for these reactions to happen so um, those reactions could theoretically just happen if the the two uh, substrate got close enough to each other they, they could form the product just the enzymes what they do is like to kind of say hey come here and come here and you guys are going to react together um, and so it's always a two-step reaction the enzyme binds with the substrate or substrates you get an enzyme substrate complex and then this is a catalytic step that allows this enzyme substrate complex to uh, produce the product and you would get the enzyme plus the product and then this enzyme starts back over there picks up the next substrate and then the reaction is going to repeat itself over and over again okay the michaelis menton model um, is a model to account for the uh, enzymatic rates and it is based on the concentration of the enzyme and the substrate so um, this is the equation the vo equals v max um, of the substrate um, divided by km plus the substrate concentration 
And uh, so V0 is the initial velocity when the product concentration is zero. S is the substrate concentration. Both Vmax and Km are constants that are characteristic um, of specific enzymes. So those are known um, and they're plugged into the analyzer. It's not anything that you have to calculate. Plus, th these things are usually calculated by the analyzer. It's just kind of nice to know what the, the math and the process behind that is. So uh, this model uh, shows that you will have an increased reaction rate until the substrate binding sites are, are uh, depleted. So what happens in this model is you can see that you had a little bit of your lag phase and then you have you go straight up and you're in first order kinetics. When you're in first order kinetics, the rate depends on the concentration of substrate. So in this one, we have velocity over substrate concentration and the, the more um, substrate concentration you have, the faster right, the re, uh, reaction is going to happen right there. And as long as um, there are open sites on the enzyme for the substrates to bind, you're going to be here in this uh, linear phase. Then when you get here, it curves and flattens, and then the reaction cannot happen any faster. It means that all your enzymatic active binding sites are completely saturated with substrate and the, the reaction simply cannot go any faster and, and no longer um, depends on the concentration of the substrate. So adding any more substrate does not make the reaction go any faster because the, all the enzyme substrate um, active sites there are bound up. So it's kind of like all of the assembly lines are running at full speed and you cannot make them run any faster by adding any more substrate or anything like that. Okay, so what are things that can inhibit enzymes? We have um, competitive in inhibition, we have non-competitive in inhibition and uncompetitive inhibition. So these are all things that can basically turn off the enzyme activity. So um, we, we don't always need to produce those products based, you know, from those substrates. And that's a really neat thing that the body can do is it can actually release the enzymes or um, as needed, or it can, um, they can, you know, have competitive or non-competitive or uncompetitive inhibition to prevent too much of the product from being made. So when you have a competitive inhibition, a competitor molecule binds to the active site on the enzyme and it prevents the substrate from binding. Uh, it is reversible so that a uh, com competitor molecule can unbind itself. This is um, often a mechanism used uh, for drugs to turn off certain enzymes. Um, Non-competitive inhibition, the competitor binds on the allosteric site, so not on the active site. So remember, the allosteric site is a site away from the active site, it's still on the enzyme, but when it binds to that site, it changes the conformation of the enzyme, and that changes the shape of the active site, which prevents the substrate from binding. Those, um, the, the binding of the competitor on that allosteric site is an irreversible bond, so it just inactivates that enzyme. Um, and then uncompetitive binding, um, a molecule will bind uh, when the um, substrate is bound to the enzyme. So the substrate binds to the enzyme, and then this, um, think of it as this molecule almost like a lid that's binding there on the enzyme substrate complex and prevents the reaction from happening in the product from being released and stuff. Okay, so then we also have uh, things that can turn enzymes on. So we have activators, coenzymes, and prosthetic groups. So activators are molecules that bind and increase activity of the enzyme. They can be cofactors such as magnesium and calcium. Um, coenzymes are organic substances that are loosely um, bound and they help the reaction like NAD. And uh, prosthetic groups are tightly bound molecules that are they've become part of the enzymes and they are required for it to function. Um, a prosthetic group could be, again, could be a magnesium or calcium or zinc or something like that. So um, obviously if you don't have, if you need these and you don't have enough, then your enzymatic reactions aren't going to happen in an optimal way. Okay, so enzyme reaction conditions, we've already hinted at that already earlier. So um, pH and temperature are two big um, 
conditions that will affect the rate of the enzymatic reaction. And uh, enzymes are pH dependent, so it really depends on uh, what pH that enzyme is made to react, but you need to, um, that reaction needs to be controlled on pH and it has to be adjusted and be just right, or it will affect uh, the rate of the reaction and uh, the temperature. And so um, enzymes have <clears throat> temperature at which they, they function optimally for your body enzymes is going to be body temperature 37 celsius uh, a lot of times if uh, the temperatures increase slightly such as when you're running a fever it actually makes those enzymatic reactions happen faster and better so so a fever uh, or running a temperature is a beneficial thing for your immune system and then um another thing that is interesting is uh, so if if the, the temperature drops the um, enzymatic re reactions will slow to even suspend, but it does not like it does not damage the enzyme beyond repair, so that if you bring the temperature back up, these enzymatic reactions can start back up again. So, uh, however, if you get enzymes too hot, um, they can completely inactivate and denature and and not work at all. So um, if you are in measuring in zero order kinetic, um, you will uh, measure enzyme concentration. Enzyme concentration will affect the rate of the reaction. If you are measuring in first order kin kinetics, the substrate concentration will affect the rate and the speed of the reaction stuff. Of course, the presence of activators inhibitors are also going to uh, affect the reaction rate. Um, and speed activators will make them happen better. Inhibitors obviously will slow it down. So, uh, also enzymes, they catalyze the same reaction but have different structural and biochemical properties and sometimes they're found in different locations in the body. Um, they, um, for example, alkaline phosphatase has also enzymes, lactate dehydrogenase has also enzymes, creatine kinase has also enzyme, and uh, CKMB, creatine kinase, muscle brain, uh, is one of the commonly measured isoenzyme. Um, the LDH isoenzymes and alkaline phosphatase isoenzymes are not commonly measured, although you can measure them. Uh, the lab techniques for measuring isoenzymes are usually either electrophoresis or immunoassay, and immunoassay is what would be used if uh, you were measuring it on an analyzer. So uh, enzyme measurements are usually performed on serum plasma or sometimes on other body fluids. Um, enzymes have very low concentrations. Um, and uh, there are two types of assays. There are endpoint assays and kinetic assays. Endpoint assays run over fixed time periods. And then uh, the amount of product is what is measured and it correlated to the enzyme activity. And uh, then and concentration, and then uh, the kinetic assays. The reaction is monitored continuously over time. Uh, most enzymatic um, assays, or most um, assays that measure enzymes like CK and alkaline phosphatase and all that, are kinetic assays. So that um, you, it starts the reaction, and it takes measurements and in increments uh, over time. And then after a, a certain amount of time, uh, then you get the um, concentration. So um, the kinetic assays always have to be read in zero order. Um, the unit of enzyme measurement is international units per liter. Sometimes it's you'll see IU per L, sometimes you'll see U per L, and it's usually it's a big U, uh, and either one are fine. Uh, it's a measure of, of activity of the enzyme, and it corresponds to the amount of enzyme required to convert one, convert one micromole of the substrate into the product in one minutes. And that is the end of the presentation and thank you for hanging in there.